So um, our speaker today is, is, is James Millen. Uh, James is a, a, an expert in the field of um, optomechanics. He started uh, with his PhD at Imperial College. Uh, he then did his, uh, his sorry, with his undergraduate at Imperial College. He then went to do his PhD um, with uh, Matthew Jones at Durham University, uh, working on ultra cold strontium Rydberg atoms. Um, he, in 2011, he worked, moved to University College London and working with um, P Professor Peter Baker, uh, Barker, sorry, um, he set up experiments uh, in the field of levitated uh, optomechanics using laser beams and uh, optical cavities to cool, cool charged silicon nanoparticles. Um, and he also worked with Dr. Janet Anders uh, to conduct research in the field of quantum thermodynamics. Uh, in 2015, uh, James left London and he moved to Vienna um, on a Marie Curie Fellowship to work in the group of Professor uh, Marcus Arndt. Uh, and there he did a number of exciting projects, um, including studies of rotational optomechanics of uh, silicon nanorods, um, which were, I think at the time and still are, the most frequency stable mechanical objects ever created, um, which are very exciting work. Uh, in 2017, uh, James was awarded the Bates Prize um, for his uh, work on experimental and theoretical quantum optomechanics. And in 2018, he moved back to London as a lecturer in advanced photonics, founding the Levitated Nanophotonics Group uh, at King's College London. Uh, today, James is going to talk to us about quantum experiments with microscale particles. And uh, with that, I'd like to hand over the floor to you. Over to you, James. Thank you. Great. Let me just share my screen. Um, can you see that fine? Yes, we can see that fine. Thanks. Fantastic. All right. So thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, indeed, it's a public holiday. We have four, four days uh, of holiday. And like everyone uh, in Britain, what you do with a four day holiday is you do work on your house. Um, so I, before this talk, I had to very hurriedly have a, have a shower because I noticed I was completely covered in wood dust uh, from fixing our house. Um, but it's a very welcome uh, break from that. Um, so this talk where I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, quantum experiments and microscale particles, um, I, I, I assumed that because our field is still quite small, but there, there wouldn't be um, many experts in the field of levitated optomechanics or, or you know, the optical control of um, particles levitated in a vacuum. Um, so I'm giving, giving rather an overview talk um, because I noticed that the, the talk is re has a reasonably long slot. I've thrown in a few technical slides here and there, which I thought some people might be interested or not. Um, but pretty much uh, anything in this talk, if you want me to expand on further, please do ask me afterwards and, and, uh, and I will talk further about it. Um, so I always start with these slides in case I, I forget at the end. Uh, so, oh, one second. Uh, so here is my research team. Um, uh, although Ben, who's highlighted in yellow, is a, is a collaborator, he's not actually in my group, um, unfortunately. Uh, so we started at King's, uh, our lab was opened in June 2019. Um, so we're still a very young group, especially with COVID happening, uh, we're an experimental group. Um, and we do work um, uh, where the motivation is always to uh, study the interface between uh, nanophysics and, and some other kind of physics, uh, whether that be quantum mechanics in one direction, whether that be more macroscopic physics like thermodynamics in the other direction. Um, and we use uh, a particular system, which is um, uh, microparticles levitated in a vacuum to study this. Um, they're excellent for studying this regime um, because they're small enough that they get buffeted around by their environment. Um, they're big enough that they don't get buffeted around by their environment to the point that you can't confine them. Uh, you can track them nice and easily. And as you'll see, we think they're probably at the edge of the size scale uh, where you have a hope of doing some quantum mechanics with them. And we also do a lot of work on technology, on building sensors um, and such like. So and miniaturization and such like. So the other thing I wanted to mention, if there are people who are interested in this field more generally, is we just started um, an EPSRC quantum technologies network, which I lead, uh, which is called LeviNet. Um, so this has captured, uh, I think, uh, all of the groups in the world who do, uh, who have a goal of studying quantum physics on one level or another, or fundamental physics using particles levitated in a vacuum. 
um, both experimental and theory groups. Uh, so if you um, are interested in being part of this, if you, you know, feel that you overlap experimentally or theoretically, uh, please do get in touch. We have a, a, a Slack workspace, which is over 100 people in at the moment, um, which you don't have to pay for. Uh, we organize conferences. We have lots of travel funding and, and the opportunity to go and uh, embed yourself in other research groups and have that funded, um, regardless of where you're from in the world. Um, so do get in touch if that's something you'd be interested in. Joining um, uh, is very informal. Uh, joining doesn't mean anything. All right, so here, here is my um, headline motivational slide, uh, which is a little bit um, maybe clickbait. Um, and uh, my, 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 my thesis here is the question, do you believe in quantum physics? Um, which I think the more you think about it is a, is a less trivial question you might think. So if you go back to the, um, uh, the founding fathers, then someone like Niels Bohr, um, in a way, certainly didn't believe in quantum physics at all scales. He believed that if you even defining what a measurement instrument is, um, there would there re requires a different realm of physics, which we tend to call classical physics. Um, and I, I would also like to point out, um, although I won't go into it uh, here, um, that that you, it, this doesn't have to be a kind of interpretational question of our oh, Copenhagen interpretation kind of question. Um, I think it's a totally reasonable question, regardless how you how you view quantum mechanics, um, to ask if it makes sense to be assigning wave functions to this, that, and the other. I think there's also an awful lot of uh, co um, confusion between uh, what decoherence actually means and, and what it provides you, um, and um, uh, what wave function collapse might be, if that's a concept which you believe in. Um, uh, and there's many other kind of foundational questions which do actually, uh, the more you think about it, make it a less and less ridiculous question to doubt quantum mechanics. Um, and so there's all kinds of experiments where people are trying to uh, answer this question as is quantum mechanics the theory that describes physics at all scales. Um, and so normally what you try and do is you try and observe some kind of quantum mechanics uh, using a, a very large object. And so you might turn to me and you might very reasonably say, well, James, this is done. There's all kinds of amazing experiments involving huge objects like the LIGO mirrors or, you know, these micro mechanical oscillators, um, uh, which have shown entanglements, um, uh, correlations, all kinds of nice things. Um, but my, my answer is, and in fact, you can formally answer this, um, that, well, actually, that's, that's uh, um, microscopic quantum phenomena being supported by macroscopic objects. Uh, and in fact, when you get down to nitty gritty, you can actually start to look at how many atoms of the massive object might be participating in this uh, quantum state. And it might be very small. Uh, that's always the argument against uh, squids being macroscopic quantum objects. Um, so uh, the kind of... Um, uh, way we think about this is a concept called macroscopicity, uh, which is a mathematical way of saying, um, how much would I have to change classical physics to explain this experiment? And in these kind of experiments with macroscopic objects, you don't have to change classical physics very much to explain them. Where you do have to start doing some work is when you do, you know, one of these like incredible um, uh, um, atomic superposition uh, experiments, um, like from the Kasevich group, this one, where you can get a single atom and you could put it in a superposition of so large that in principle you could walk through the middle of it, right? So that's a, that's a, a uniquely quantum state. The superposition is kind of the simplest quantum state you can't um, describe using classical physics. And, and the, the, the state is much larger than the object. Um, good. And so the largest object which... Um, uh, has been unambiguously shown to be in a superposition state, which is larger than the size of this object, um, is this uh, rather um, uh, a large molecule here made of about 2,000 atoms. It weighs uh, 2.5 times 10 to the 4 atomic mass units. Um, and that went through a matter wave into from it. Um, and so what's important um, uh, about matter wave interferometers, um, and because they're very complicated, and you might go, well, why do I have to do that? is of course, it's always very hard to prove you've, you've had a superposition state um, and interferometry is an unambiguous uh, piece of evidence that you're 
your object of study was in a superposition state at some point. I also think it's very interesting in these experiments that you do interference with the center of mass. Uh, so you don't need to worry about the 2000 atoms. And in fact, internally, these molecules are often extremely hot um, and that doesn't really matter. Um, I, I think that's a really overlooked and totally fascinating aspect of quantum mechanics is that you know, we assign a wave function to the center of mass of this object. Um, uh, and that's the bit that does the quantum mechanics there. Okay, so that's, a, that's fantastic. That's, a, that's a, a definitely um, a large object in a superposition state. That is the, 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 the best test of um, that quantum mechanics persists on a macroscopic scale that we have. Uh, this is from the Arndt group in Vienna. I was there when they did this experiment. I wasn't involved. And you should look it up if you're an experimental physicist because it's an incredibly beautiful experiment. And the amount of effort they have to go to to making it stable and accounting for Coriolis forces and all kinds of things is just wonderful. So generally, there's a bit of a recipe for uh, um, creating a macroscopic superposition. Um, first off, you need some kind of source. Um, you need some object which is going to, to be in a superposition. Um, then you typically need to cool it down to close to its ground state. Um, uh, so normally you assume that this object is confined in some kind of potential um, and you need to cool it down to its ground state because otherwise um, you get an admixture of all the states and as you try and do your interference experiment, they all just kind of wash out the interference pattern. Um, and then you need to do um, uh, your interference um, to, to create the superposition and then prove that you had that superposition. So typically, if you were to get a little one of these lovely little uh, drum resonators that people do and they've cooled them to the ground state, and then the size of the ground state is, is, is some picometers or something. So it's much smaller than the, the size of the, the atoms inside this, this resonator. So because of that, you could never really put, you know, you could never, you could put it in a superposition state, but you couldn't really do interference with it. It'd be too hard to see. Uh, certainly not interference, uh, superposition state that's larger than the object. And so in my community, we're pushing to, to do uh, interference experiments create macroscopic um, superpositions of nano or micro particles. So that's bigger than about 10 to the six atomic mass units, which let's say that's bigger than, you know, a few nanometers and people have proposals all the way up to millimeter even, uh, but that's a bit outside of our technology right now, but there certainly are proposals. So this is the kind of object we're looking at. Um, so here's a recipe. How do you go about fulfilling that recipe? I oh, know I'm ahead of myself. Um, why would we do this experiment? Sorry. Um, why would we uh, want to do an experiment where we test quantum mechanics? What do we uh, exactly hope to learn? Um, so one thing that motivates uh, a certain group of people um, is uh, learning about wave function collapse. And I know that this is a somewhat controversial issue because uh, sometimes it can be considered a little bit interpretational. Um, but uh, nonetheless, um, decoherence, the clues in the name, decoherence causes a, a lack of coherence. Uh, so um, it makes it you know, very hard to maintain your system in a superposition state or an entangled state, uh, but it doesn't cause wave function collapse, by which I mean decoherence doesn't explain um, how a quantum state evolves from being um, uh, in, in some kind of linear mixture of many different possibilities uh, into one which you measure. There's no explanation there. And so for many, many years, uh, knocking, around, knocking around have been uh, this whole class of things, which are sometimes called collapse models or dynamical reduction models. Um, and so this is modifications to the Schrodinger equation, which actually means it's a theory and not an interpretation because it's testable. So it's a modification to the Schrodinger equation uh, where it introduces some classical field, which we don't know about, but that exists everywhere in the universe. Um, uh, and it interacts with your systems in a very specific way. So it has to be a stochastic way um, because you need randomness. Uh, it has to be nonlinear because it causes a collapse, um, which is a nonlinear process. Um, and it also has to act in a mass and uh, superposition size dependent way. So some of these, these models get quite complex, and, uh, but it's a phenomenological explanation for why we don't see you know, big molecules in space whizzing around in superposition states or something. Um, I have to say that a lot of the parameter space for these models has been excluded, but theorists are really clever and keep on finding new windows in the parameter space. 
Um, but there's many different kinds of experiments you can use to uh, explore um, these models and um, um, macroscopic superpositions that are the most flexible and, and exclude the, the largest amount of the parameter space. So there's also a, uh, another classical field um, um, which people sometimes suggest uh, causes the, the collapse of the wave function, and that's um, gravity. Um, so there's there's two different ways of thinking about this, which I, I'm assured are somehow formally identical in a way that I conceptually can't understand. Um, so you can imagine uh, that if you get a large object and you put it into a superposition state, then the question is, well, what happens to that object's gravitational field? And do you get some kind of self-attraction? And so I think Penrose made an argument where you can put a, um, a size limit on uh, superpositions until they're not stable anymore because of that interaction. And that's nice because that, that, that's not got many free parameters in. Uh, it's not nice because it's way outside of what we can test currently, but lots of people are trying. Um, and, and also similarly, if you have um, one object in a, in a spatial superposition, and the different parts of the superposition are in different gravitational fields due to the environment, that can also destabilize the superposition. Um, and somehow they work out to be the same thing. Uh, if anyone ever wants to explain that to me, I'd really appreciate it. Um, but also, actually, if you, if you get your huge lump of glass sat in a vacuum, and it's, uh, you cool it to its ground state and you presume, produce a macroscopic superposition, that's really, really hard to do. That's a hard experiment. And it's hard because it's hard to prevent the decoherence. But a lot of people flip that on its head and say, well, that's a super sensitive system. So there are proposals out there for really, really extreme force sensitivity, uh, for, test for measuring gravitational waves in a, in, a, in a tabletop detector. I think tabletop means 100 meters. Um, uh, and even for uh, detecting dark matter, and so that often relies on instead of some kind of direct interaction between uh, dark matter and your macroscopic object, uh, what if you can infer the, the dark matter um, uh, um, uh, causing a decoherence with this macroscopic state, which is far more sensitive. Um, yeah, so there's, there's many, many things people are interested in. Um, and there's also the very famous proposal, which I don't talk about here, um, for uh, testing quantum theories of gravity uh, using um, uh, uh, um, interferometric scheme with microparticles. But that's an extremely challenging experiment, but it's caused a lot of discussion in our field and there's a lot of research groups have started moving towards that experiment. All right, so here is my, um, my recipe. Um, by the way, I've just realized, uh, Jack, that I have in no way anything within my vision that tells me what time it is. So please do give me some warning if I'm getting close to the end of my time. I, I will. Um, no worries. Thank you. Um, so here's a recipe. I gave you the recipe for uh, doing some kind of macroscopic quantum physics experiment. Uh, so how do we actually do that? Um, so the first thing you need is a source. Um, and uh, as a source, you need to, to levitate some kind of object. You need, you need it uh, in a vacuum to prevent decoherence. You need to, to start from some localized position. Um, so there's, there's several ways you can do that, which, is, which I'll talk about later, uh, although not in technical detail. Um, so for dielectric objects, you can use a focused laser beam. That's an optical tweezer and can find particles in a vacuum. That's by far the most common way that people do things. Um, if your particles are charged, which they'll always be a bit charged, um, uh, unless you deliberately try and neutralize them, uh, then you can use a pull trap, you can use electrical fields to levitate your particles. Uh, and there's people, many people trying to use uh, magnetic fields to levitate particles in, in many different ways. It could be diamagnetics, it can be using superconductors, and um, it can be using uh, ferromagnets. There's, there's so many different schemes. Um, and experimental, experimental progress is really starting to go ahead there because uh, uh, these magnetic uh, systems are very, very low noise. Uh, so that, that, that's the, the ways you would create your source. Uh, so cooling is a whole different matter. Uh, there's many different ways of cooling this particle. So all of those methods I just showed you, you, you confine your particle. Uh, it's in a harmonic potential, so it's a harmonic oscillator, so it's oscillating backwards and forwards, and you want to extract energy from its motion to get to the ground state. 
Um, so starting on the left, um, uh, the, the first proposed method uh, for doing this was with uh, optical cavities. So in 2010, uh, three different research groups um, proposed that you should be able to cool uh, uh, nanoparticles to the ground state of a harmonic potential using an optical cavity. Uh, so it's sideband cooling. I can, I can tell you about it in more detail if you wish, uh, but you just engineer a situation where your oscillating particle preferentially scatters photons into a higher energy sideband. And so where does the energy for that come from? Well, it comes from the motion of the particle, so it cools down. Uh, so 2010 is really when this field started, uh, which is nice, uh, round number. Uh, also, you can use feedback. Uh, so these objects are easily large enough to track. Um, so you watch them move, and then you either uh, get some force as proportional to velocity and push back against them. Um, so that's really common now. It's called cold damping. Um, so you can use electrical fields or you can use other laser beams. Um, or you can modulate the, the potential depth itself. Um, that's called parametric feedback cooling. Um, and there are other more complicated um, uh, schemes. Uh, so for example, this one on the right from the, uh, from the ETE group in Paris, um, where they uh, managed to cool the center of mass of a levitated nano diamond by manipulating the spins of an MB center uh, within, which is very, very exciting. And indeed, uh, Two of these methods, the cavity method and the feedback method, have both enabled cooling to the ground state. So this was the first um, example. So it was in 2020. So the group that did it was one of the, the first groups in our field. Uh, and so it took almost exactly 10 years to realize this. Um, and so it's a slight modification of cavity cooling where you don't pump your optical cavity, uh, but rather your particle is trapped in a laser beam and it scatters light into the optical cavity. Um, so the particle pumps the cavity and this is called coherent scattering. I believe it's been used for molecules anyway. And so this enabled um, the, the first uh, cooling to the ground state of a 150 nanometer diameter silica sphere. Um, so that's incredible if you think about it. Um, ground state cooling doesn't really prove much. And there's, there's a, as we'll see, there's a long way between ground state cooling and, and matter wave interferometry. Um, but to have a huge chunk of glass, <laughs> um, and if you, if you illuminate these with visible light, you can see them um, uh, levitating there. And um, to cool it to the ground state of its motion, um, I just think it's incredible. And since then, people have managed to uh, cool to the ground state also using feedback, um, sometimes using very complicated schemes involving Kalman filtering, uh, sometimes not. Um, and I just put in an extra slide because uh, something which I'm very interested in, and I'll talk a lot more about, um, is not just spheres, but, but uh, anisotropic particles, um, because rotation is very interesting to me, because uh, rotation is uh, nonlinear. Um, and uh, cavity cooling works equally well for um, uh, cooling the rotation of objects. So this is a slightly different scenario, just because it's a nice video. But this is just imagining if you throw a cylinder into an optical cavity, all of the different degrees of freedom interact with the cavity field. So those red lines are the optical cavity field. Uh, the intensity of the red line is the intensity of the light in the cavity, the particles shifting the cavity resonance by its motion over time. Um, this particular example is imagining a particle flying through the cavity to create a cold beam. Um, but yes, you can, uh, uh, theoretically at least, you can cool all degrees of freedom of this object uh, to the ground state. Once When it's in the cavity, the rotation is linear actually, it's a, it's a harmonic motion, we call it libration. Um, and indeed, there's a paper on the archive from Peter Barker's group where they've, they've used the cavity and they've seen cooling in six degrees of freedom simultaneously. They're not to the ground state. So the final step is that you need to do some interference. Um, so you might imagine something like this, you have your cold uh, particle, um, you drop it through uh, some kind of grating. Now, this wouldn't be a physical grating because the grating separation um, would be uh, smaller than the particle. Um, so it'd be an optical grating. Um, there's already lots of experience of that. Uh, you would generate some kind of um, uh, interference pattern, um, which you would then measure. So, so people imagine you deposit these particles onto a slide. Um, and then you can use the methods like the ARNT group did for detecting uh, matter wave interferometry of molecules to, to measure them. There's also a nice way of thinking about why you need to do cooling, uh, because 
uh, if you think about uh, the double slit experiment, for example, um, then the effective um, size of your source, uh, your, your initial slit, um, is uh, related to the temperature. Um, so you can, by cooling it, you make a coherent source of particles. And so there's lots of problems with this, um, uh, just beyond decoherence, um, which is a massive problem. Uh, a, sing a collision with a single gas molecule is enough to ruin this experiment. The main problem with the picture I have in front of you right there is that these are not atoms. Every single nanoparticle is different. So that makes imagining this kind of interference pattern very, very hard. And so there are all kinds of other proposals people have. So um, Romero Oriel Eishart in, uh, or sorry, Oriel Romero Eishart in Innsbruck um, has these proposals for making, um, he calls them skate parks, uh, magnetic skate parks uh, for particles um, where you could then uh, do it all magnetically and you could then recover your particle, um, recycle your particle and do the experiment again. These experiments are looking so hard um, that a lot of people have, have started thinking about putting them in space. Uh, so Rainer Kautenbeck, who's at uh, uh, Vienna and also in Ljubljana in Slovenia, um, uh, for a long, long time has been working on something called the macro proposal, which has been through various stages of ESA approval about putting a, a, a nanoparticle matter wave interferometer in space, uh, because then you don't have such a problem with free full time. Um, it's hard. <laughs> Uh, if you're interested, look it up. There's loads and loads of white papers and progress reports over the years. Um, and there was recently this comments uh, article in, in uh, Nature um, uh, suggesting roughly how much it might cost to do such, a, such an experiment and that it's a no-brainer for the amount that you would learn from doing it. Of course, they would say that. Um, all right. So why is it so hard um, and why do we have to do this matter wave interferometry? Because you don't have to, you don't, so, the, well, it's not the matter wave interferometry. Why do we need this diffraction grating? So, you know, in these experiments, you have some source, you drop the particle because you have to let its wave function expand enough to coherently illuminate your diffraction grating. That takes time and space. And all that time, the particle can decohere and interact with black body radiation. Then it has to interact with the grating, the fraction grating. You better hope that interaction doesn't cause decoherence, which it will. Mm. So why do we have to do such complicated experiments, um, whereas people who do atomic physics don't? Uh, and the reason is that atom interferometers um, rely on, on coupling to a discrete system, namely energy levels. Um, so this discrete system, this nonlinear discrete system, allows you to do your interferometry. And we don't have that um, uh, for big chunks of glass. So we have to get our discreteness where we can produce our superposition by having this, this grating, which gives uh, discrete positions of our particle. Um, so something I'm very interested in is the fact that angular momentum is discrete. So in free space, angular momentum is quantized. So angular momentum is, is immediately a discrete system. So this motivated a lot of my research in the last few years. Um, so we've managed to really get control over these levitated uh, uh, nano cylinders, which I'll talk a bit more about. Um, so we can control uh, their alignment. So that, that's a harmonic motion uh, as well as their center of mass. And we can also control their rotation. And as Jack mentioned in his kind introduction, uh, we can control their rotation so well uh, that we produced what I believe is the most frequency stable mechanical object ever made. So it was a, 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 a cylinder, um, like a one micron long cylinder of silicon that rotates at one megahertz in a vacuum or a line width of one microhertz. We have to, we have to wait four days to be able to resolve this, um, which is a frequency stability of one part in 10 to 11. I'm not going to talk about that anymore, but I do have slides at the end. If this is something that people are interested in, then I'm very, very happy to talk about this system because it's very, very rich in physics, how you produce this uh, very, very stable rotation. So I think now I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, how we imagine using angular momentum um, and the discrete nature of angular momentum to do matter wave interferometry, uh, which, which gets away from all of these diffraction gratings, which are a real problem. Nope, that'll be the slide after, sorry. Uh, like I say, I threw in a few technical slides here and there um, because I thought people might be interested. I just wanted to show you our silicon nanorods. So um, we, that technology has come on. Uh, you can now buy them uh, because I, I paid this company a lot to, to set up the masks. Um, so this is what our silicon nanorods look like. 
so silicon is great. Uh, most people use silica because it's very cheap to buy silica nanospheres that are well size specified. But silicon has a higher refractive index. So that means that when you trap them, their frequencies are higher, which means the ground state is higher in energy. Uh, but also asymmetrical particles have a higher susceptibility than spheres. So all in all, um, a silicon nanorod has a susceptibility about seven times higher than a silicon nanosphere. Uh, so you get much stronger trapping forces. Um, we can fabricate them in a whole range of, of, of uh, aspect ratios. Um, and I should also point out that uh, we have methods for selectively loading one of these at a time into our optical traps with about 80% efficiency. And um, by changing their aspect ratios, you can move all of the frequencies of their motion around when they're trapped. Uh, so the one down the middle, Z, that's the uh, left hand is oscillating the center of mass motion. And then by changing the length of it, you can change the frequency of the li vibrational motion, this kind of angular motion. Um, so there are different reasons why you want different geometries. Okay, hopefully here comes my matter wave scheme. Great. So this is the experiment we imagine. We take a silicon nanorod and we hold it in an optical trap and we cool it just a little bit. You don't have to cool it to the ground state, you cool it just a little bit. You let it go. And as you let it go, it starts to evolve into a superposition of all of its angular momentum states. Now, because the angular momentum states are discrete, at a characteristic time after you let it go, all of the angular momentum states interfere. And the experimental signature of that is at this revival time, the nanorod will always point in the same direction, which you can measure. And that's not the classical prediction. So if you, if you see these revivals in the, in the alignment of these nanorods, then you've proved you've had a macroscopic angular momentum superposition. Um, so there's no diffraction grating required. Um, these these uh, revival times are some, you know, tens of milliseconds, uh, so the experiments don't take too long. Um, and in that time, the particles have barely dropped, so you can just switch your laser field back on again, like so, and recapture the particle, um, so you can recycle the same particle over and over again. So this is an experiment we're pushing really hard to do, because we really strongly believe that it's way more feasible uh, than the center of mass uh, matter wave interferometry experiments. Um, Good. So you can ask me more about parameters if you if you wish. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's a lot of talk about um, how you do this matter wave inter interferometry experiment. And really, all I've talked to you there about is using optical methods to do so. And there's lots of good reasons for using optical fields to control these particles, because Optical fields are really stable. We can control laser beams very, very well. Um, so we can both uh, precisely capture them and we can control their motion very well with optical fields. But there are actually several problems with optical fields, which will motivate the rest of my talk. Um, so one is that um, actually the optical trap depth is very low. It's maybe 10,000 Kelvin, uh, which might sound like a lot, but it, you know, there's a lot of noise or uh, gas collisions which are statistically away from the mean such that it's actually very very hard to optically trap particles in very high vacuum you have to do a, you have to do feedback stabilization on the particle motion to capture them um, uh, to hold them in a vacuum they just become really unstable um, and they interact with the gas around them in quite a complex way so that's a problem also, actually, the interaction between light and a big chunk of silica isn't very strong at all, especially when you're doing optical cavity cooling. Uh, you know, these particles are maybe 150 nanometers in size. Uh, the beam waste of an optical cavity is some microns, maybe, you know, maybe even tens of microns. So the overlap between those two things is very poor. Uh, we did quite a lot of work in Vienna, actually, in, in, in fabricating uh, silicon micro cavities. Um, so to have much smaller optical fields, and then the coupling was much, much higher. And this also seems to have inspired the community who are trying to move in this direction now. And actually, the ultimate uh, noise source in these experiments, incredibly, um, is the collision of photons with your chunk of glass, which I think is amazing. So it's photon scattering. So this uh, um, graph here, which is from the Novotny group at ETH, uh, what you see here is these are particles which are being continuously cooled in their three degrees of freedom, X, Y, and Z. 
And on the x-axis is the pressure. So when you're higher in pressure, you're higher in temperature. So the y-axis is temperature in phonons. Um, so when you're higher in pressure, you're higher in temperature because your particles coupling to all the gas collisions. And so as you pump the gas uh, away, then the temperature should just get lower and lower and lower. Uh, but it doesn't. At some point, it levels out. And this is not due to the noise in the feedback loop. Uh, this is due to uh, the fact that the photons start to recoil um, noticeably from your, well, the photon recoil becomes noticeable compared to other sources of noise. Um, actually, a laser beam is quite hot, <laughs> uh, but the coupling to that hot bath is very weak. Uh, so that's a real problem as well, which you can't overcome. Uh, also, solids, of course, always absorb photons, no matter how low the absorption, there's some absorption. And when you're in, you know, ultra high vacuum, there's nothing to take that heat away. Um, so we did a lot of work where we saw microparticles vaporizing in a vacuum. So the, I, the proposal I came up with um, was uh, to get rid of the optical fields altogether. Um, and to do that, I wanted to use a pull trap, which is, of course, a much older technology. Um, now, lots of people use pull traps. I just, I just list a few of the groups there uh, who've done work with micro, nano or microparticles in pull traps. Um, but uh, I wanted to take it a little bit further and I really wanted to get rid of the light altogether. So to not even need light to detect the motion of these particles. Um, and uh, I'll explain uh, how that happens uh, in the next slide. It's actually an old idea, um, but this is our linear pull trap. Uh, so it's a slightly strange linear pull trap uh, because we have end cap electrodes, which we've now aligned better, but we have end cap electrodes, which are very, very close in the middle there. That's about a millimeter away. And now you can see one microparticle trapped in the middle. Um, and the reason for that is that we wanted to detect the motion of these charged particles um, through the end cap electrodes um, so that we could detect their motion electrically and get rid of the um, light altogether. Uh, so this is kind of how, how the image might look. The particle oscillates around as it is charged. So as it oscillates around, it induces a current in a circuit. Um, and you could detect that uh, potentially with a LC circuit, the, the pull trap itself is a capacitor. And so I, I had, I, so this is, this is not my idea as such, um, because people used to do this with trapped ions, basically before lasers, uh, laser cooling was a thing. Um, um, but then, you know, the problem is that the charge to mass ratio of, a, of, a, of an ion is so much higher always, and it will be for a ma ma massive object like this. Um, but then I got some faith again when I realized that the current you induce by doing this is proportional to the charge to square root mass ratio. And then actually a very highly charged microparticle starts to look a bit like a strontium ion as far as the circuit is concerned. Uh, the secret I don't talk much about is that the frequencies here are extremely low. So we're still trying to do this experiment um, because the frequencies are in like the tens of hertz, which is really problematic. Um, and you can't build an LC circuit with a resonance of 10 hertz. And if you can, uh, please get in contact with me and, and talk to me about it. We're trying to do it with lock-in amplifiers. What's also nice with pull traps is you can trap anything as long as it's charged. These are meant to be images of a metal uh, or an organic material. Um, so, so there's all kinds of things you could put in an experiment like this, uh, because as far as the experiment's concerned, all it cares about is the charge to mass, well, square root mass ratio. So the coupling of these charged microparticles to the circuit actually allows cooling. So if you, um, if you just attach a, 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 a resistor um, to the end cap electrodes, um, then you will dissipate energy into that resistor. So this would be the equation of motion uh, for the uh, momentum of your particle. Um, so there's just the, the harmonic term, the first term, a, a term that depends on its charge and some kind of damping rate due to the resistor. And so you see the damping rate gamma R here. And what do we see here? Well, we see a charge squared to mass ratio, um, uh, which is you know, like a charge to root mass ratio. So again, the cooling rate uh, seems reasonable um, uh, for the, even these massive objects. So the other terms in our equation, uh, the eta is this geometric parameter that's very common in pull traps. It's somewhat less than one. A D is the separation between the end caps. Um, and our effective is, is the effective resistance because maybe you might make a tuned circuit and, and boost your resistance. Um, another thing you can do um, is that actually the current which you induce 
uh, is not proportional to the position of the particle, it's proportional to its velocity. And that's amazing because uh, we have a lot of problems with, uh, with optically levitated particles because you always have to infer the velocity from the position, um, whereas this would give you a direct measure of the velocity. And the reason you have to do that is because uh, a velocity dependent force is what cools the particle down. So in principle, if you just connect the end cap electrodes together straight away, the particle should cool down. Uh, realistically, what you do is you put an amplifier in the way. Um, and so again, this is, this is not new. Uh, this is used uh, quite extensively uh, for cooling things like uh, electrons or you know, uh, other kind of exotic particles and penning traps um, where you might not have enough way of cooling them or if uh, cooling to a modest temperature is very advantageous because you inject them into your system at you know, hundreds of thousands of um, Kelvin or whatever that is in electron volts. Um, so how cold can you get? Um, well, if you do feedback cooling, then the ultimate temperature you get to um, is a product of the, the temperature of your entire circuit is in the physical temperature of the circuit, that's Johnson noise, um, and the noise temperature of your amplifier that's connecting your end caps. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about temperature limits in, in a couple of slides. Um, so, so, so here's another technical slide. Um, in terms of what we do with these experiments, so we, we're very interested in these, not just uh, for quantum reasons, but also as sensors, um, but everything gets better as you uh, shrink it down. Um, so we've done all kinds of work on miniaturizing our, um, our iron traps. So you, you induce more current, you cool faster, and you can work with a wider range of particle sizes. Um, and so we've also been working with MPL. We have these nice micro ion traps, uh, which are little chip based systems. Um, so you can get your particles nice and close to the um, electrodes and detect their motion that way as well. So we have them in the lab. Um, so I also, on, in terms of technical slides, I wasn't sure where, where to put this, I thought, but I thought people might be interested in it. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work on detection by other means. So, you know, at the moment, this, this electrical detection, I mean, it certainly will work. It's just proving to be very challenging. So we are still using light to detect these particles. Um, but, you know, it's quite hard to detect these particles. You can use some kind of quadrant detector and in the optical traps, you can use interferometric means. Uh, but the problem we were having is that these detection methods um, require quite a lot of light and they require, uh, they, they lead to an incredibly narrow field of view. If the particle moves by much, they move out of your detector or your detector becomes nonlinear. And so what you want to do is you want to use a camera, but cameras are incredibly slow. Uh, so we've been using these, these uh, objects, which are called, um, or these devices, sorry, which are called uh, event cameras. I don't know if people have heard of them before. Um, so event cameras are cameras where um, the pixels only fire when there's a change in intensity on them, which crosses a threshold. So you don't, every frame, you're not downloading the entire frame of the camera. You just download the pixels where there's been a change. And so that means even using the full range of the camera chip, you can have very, very fast readout rates. Uh, potentially they're gigahertz, the chips are good to gigahertz. Uh, no one's developed the device around the chips yet that, that, can, that can measure at that. Uh, they have very low power consumption if you're building a piece of technology and or you want to put it in space. And they also um, uh, tend to have tracking algorithms built into them. So they tend to have microprocessors and they're designed for tracking objects. They're used in industry for tracking, say, people moving in crowds or um, things on a conveyor belt. Uh, so they're designed for tracking particles. So this is when we, this little video, we turn our camera on. It looks for our trap particle. Oh, there we go. It's found our trap particle. And it puts a little box around it and says, OK, here's my little oscillating particle. So you get a funny video because it measures change in intensity. So it doesn't look like a particle moving necessarily. Um, but this is a real zoom in where you can see a particle oscillating backwards and forwards using one of these cameras. Um, and we believe that actually what we can do in real time is we can basically get two wires out of these cameras. One says X position, one says Y position. And then we can do feedback directly using the signal from the camera, which would be really, really nice. Uh, we've made good progress on that. That's just the power spectral density to show, show that you do detect the motion compared to, say, a quadrant detector. Um, yeah, so like I said, you have tracking algorithms built in it. So this is a very highly excited particle, and we've slowed this video down. You can see there's some red bounding box around it, which is an algorithm which is tracking the particle very, very 
precisely. So we've collaborated with some people at ANU who use these event cameras for tracking astronomical objects. Um, yeah, so that's really good. And something which is super interesting for our field is you can track multiple particles simultaneously. Uh, so I think we've, we've managed to track about six simultaneously at the moment, which is our best. So you can have a whole crystal of charged particles and track individually the motion of each one in real time. Um, and there's all kinds of uh, applications for this. And people are really interested in this, uh, working hard on that. Okay, back to the talk. That was just a little aside I thought some people might be interested in. So we've got these charged particles and let's imagine we get rid of our light and they're coupled to our electrical circuits. The question that you'd always get asked is, can we cool to the ground state? So I told you about this resistive cooling where the particle just dis dumps its energy into a resistor. Well, the final temperature you reach there is very straightforward. It's the physical temperature of your resistor. It's because of Johnson noise. So if you put your circuit in a uh, fridge, then your particle gets colder. Um, so, um, uh, you know, you could put it in a good dilution refrigerator of, of a few millikelvin, um, but um, if you really push the maths, the highest frequency you could have in one of these pool tracks would be like 100 megahertz. I mean, you know, that's really pushing it. We're, we're at, like I say, a few tens of hertz, but in principle, it would be possible to design a pool trap which would allow those oscillation frequencies. With the feedback cooling, it's looking a little bit uh, better. I oh, know, sorry, the five millikelvin, I'm sorry, the five millikelvin would be the ground state for a 100 megahertz oscillator, and that's not possible. Uh, but with the feedback cooling, uh, you, because you don't just rely on the physical temperature of your circuitry, you also have this noise temperature of your amplifier. So if you use a squid as your amplifier or something, um, then you can get to the ground state for a 10 megahertz oscillator. And I'm sorry, 10 megahertz is just about possible in one of these pool traps. Uh, 100 megahertz is not possible. Uh, so I would say it would be a very, very difficult way of going about ground state cooling. But in principle, you could all electrically cool to the ground state. Um, so all of the cooling rates and the, the, the signals you could detect and, um, and you know, how much you have to turn up your amplifiers all depend on how highly charged the particle can be. This is another technical slide I put in. I didn't know if people were interested. Um, so uh, this is showing the theoretical maximum charge you can fit on a dielectric object of a certain radius in number of charges. You can fit more positive charges on a sphere than negative charges because positive charges are heavier, so it's harder for them to leave the surface. Um, so the circle on there is the, the highest charge object I could find in the literature. Uh, and the red cross is kind of actually where we're operating at the moment. So we're not doing too bad. Um, and if you want to try and uh, charge them a bit more, um, here, for your interest, is the smaller the object, the harder it is to charge it to its maximum because the field becomes larger. Um, but the, the field strengths you required are not so ridiculous. So if you have some very nice um, charge gun in your lab, uh, you could probably saturate the charge in these objects and then you know get a very, very strong coupling with your circuit. I'm going back to an old slide here as I start to finish off my talk. Um, so this is an old slide um, uh, from earlier in the talk where I said, well, why do we have to do these complicated matter wave interferometry schemes with diffraction gratings um, and the atomic physicists don't? And the reason is because you have discrete uh, energy levels in the atomic sy uh, um, systems. And then I said, well, maybe we could use um, angular momentum as a discrete system. Uh, but another option you can do is you can couple to some external discrete system or internal discrete system, like the people who work with levitated nano diamonds coupling to MV centers. But you can also couple your object to some external discrete system to produce nonlinearity. And so we have a proposal out for doing that. So we imagine we have some charged object in a pool trap. And again, it's coupled to the end cap electrodes, uh, but now it's coupled via a Cooper pair box. So this gives us some discrete energy structure. And as we will kind of see, this um, allows you to do some quantum physics with your uh, nanoparticle. Um, so we artificially introduce this discrete uh, energy structure. So the motion of the particle as it moves between the end caps modifies the voltage drop across this Cooper pair box. 
Um, and the charge state of the Cooper pair box determines a force acting on the particle because there's some voltage on the end cap electrodes which will exert a force on your particle. So now you can see that there's a coupling um, uh, between the charge state of the Cooper pair box and the motion of your particle. Uh, for those who are really interested, um, that's the interaction Hamiltonian. But what's important again is if you look at the coupling strength here, uh, we get the charge to square root to mass ratio. Um, so there's that magic number again, which all of a sudden means it's feasible to do this kind of experiment with macroscopic objects rather than just, say, ions. And the coupling strength is actually very, very high, uh, 10 megahertz. Um, that's a nice high coupling strength. And so we found a way we could exploit that. Um, so the, I think the largest charged object that has the largest charged object that has uh, undergone matter wave interferometry, uh, I think, is a proton. I might be wrong. It might be it might be ionized helium, um, but it's a very small object. And the reason for that is that the Coulomb force is incredibly strong, and so uh, decoherence of charged objects is is, is immediate. <laughs> um, and uh, so you might think this kills this proposal, but this high coupling strength um, helps you out because uh, what we found uh, was you can do some kind of pulse scheme, uh, which I won't go into the details about exactly how it works, but involving manipulating the force acting on uh, your levitated particle uh, using the Cooper pair box. Um, but the control pulses uh, can be so fast um, that you can get coherent control, which uh, is applied much, much faster than the particle can undergo decoherence. So here you'd be doing matter wave interferometry so fast that um, uh, the particle wouldn't have time to decohere. Um, and in this scheme, you read out, do all of your readout through the Cooper pair box. So you don't have to touch this particle. It just sits inside uh, this pull trap interacting with your qubit. Um, you, and you infer the uh, superposition only by the qubit. So that's a proposal which we have out. Um, and uh, you could do all kinds of things with this apart from matter wave interferometry. Um, so, you know, we imagine this uh, for doing networks. So I'm really interested in these levitated particles for doing networks anyway, uh, classical networks as well. Um, they're like little uh, quartz crystal oscillators, only levitating, which means they have very high quality factors to their motion. But, you know, we at least mathematically showed that you could do uh, a qubit qubit entanglement via the nanoparticle, and you can do um, particle particle entanglement via the qubit as well. As you wish so details in that paper james just to give you a warning um you've been talking for about 50 minutes so here's just... my last slide oh, amazing okay <laughs> yeah and that's it that's all i wanted to say um so that was maybe a, a slightly disjointed um talk but I, there was just a couple of different things i mean my research group is roughly split into two uh, people working on on rotational optomechanics and people working on these electrical systems um but yeah if you want to ask me questions um, particularly if you want more details on some of that rotational stuff, then, then please go ahead. Uh, but otherwise, thank you for attention, your attention and, um, and for the invite.